The Adventure of the Illustrious Client It can't hurt now, was Mr. Sherlock Holmes' comment when, for the tenth time in as many years, I asked his leave to reveal the following narrative. So it was that at last I obtained permission to put on record what was, in some ways, the supreme moment of my friend's career. Both Holmes and I had a weakness for the Turkish bath. It was over a smoke in the pleasant lassitude of the drying-room that I have found him less reticent and more human than anywhere else. On the upper floor of the Northumberland Avenue establishment there is an isolated corner where two couches lie side by side, and it was on these that we lay upon September the 3rd, 1902, the day when my narrative begins. I had asked him whether anything was stirring, and for answer he had shot his long, thin, nervous arm out of the sheets which enveloped him, and had drawn an envelope from the inside pocket of the coat which hung beside him. "'It may be some fussy, self-important fool,' "'It may be a matter of life or death,' said he, as he handed me the note. "'I know no more than this message tells me. "'It was from the Carlton Club, and dated the evening before. "'This is what I read. "'Sir James Damery presents his compliments to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, "'and will call upon him at 4.30 tomorrow. "'Sir James begs to say that the matter upon which he desires to consult Mr. Holmes "'is very delicate, and also very important. He trusts, therefore, that Mr. Holmes will make every effort to grant this interview, and that he will confirm it over the telephone to the Carlton Club. "'I need not say that I have confirmed it, Watson,' said Holmes as I returned the paper. "'Do you know anything of this man, Damery?' "'Well, only that his name is a household word in society.' "'Well, I can tell you a little more than that.' He has rather a reputation for arranging delicate matters which are to be kept out of the papers. You may remember his negotiations with Sir George Lewis over the Hammerford Will case. He is a man of the world with a natural turn for diplomacy. I am bound, therefore, to hope that this is not a false scent, and that he has some real need for our assistance. Our? Well, if you will be so good, Watson— "'I shall be honoured. "'Then you have the hour, four-thirty. "'Until then we can put the matter out of our heads.' "'I was living in my own rooms in Queen Anne Street at the time, "'but I was round at Baker Street before the time named. "'Sharp to the half-hour, Colonel Sir James Damery was announced. "'It is hardly necessary to describe him, "'for many will remember that large, bluff, honest personality, "'that broad, clean-shaven face, and above all that pleasant, mellow voice. Frankness shone from his grey Irish eyes, and good humour played round his mobile, smiling lips. His loosened top hat, his dark frock coat, indeed every detail from the pearl pin in the black satin cravat to the lavender spats over the varnished shoes, spoke of the meticulous care in dress for which he was famous. The big, masterful aristocrat, dominated the little room. "'Of course I was prepared to find Dr. Watson,' he remarked with a courteous bow. "'His collaboration may be very necessary, for we are dealing on this occasion, Mr. Holmes, with a man to whom violence is familiar, and who will literally stick at nothing. I should say that there is no more dangerous man in Europe.' "'I've had several opponents to whom that flattering term has been applied,' said Holmes with a smile. "'Don't you smoke? Then you will excuse me if I light my pipe. "'If your man is more dangerous than the late Professor Moriarty "'or than the living Colonel Sebastian Moran, "'then he is indeed worth meeting. May I ask his name?' "'Have you ever heard of Baron Gruner? "'You mean the Austrian murderer?' "'Colonel Damery threw up his kid-gloved hands with a laugh. "'There's no getting past you, Mr. Holmes. Wonderful!' "'So you've already sized him up as a murderer. "'It is my business to follow the details of continental crime. "'Who could possibly have read what happened at Prague "'and have any doubts as to the man's guilt? "'It was a purely technical legal point "'and the suspicious death of a witness that saved him. 
I am assured that he killed his wife when the so-called accident happened in the Splugen Pass, as if I had seen him do it. I knew also that he had come to England, and had a presentiment that sooner or later he would find me some work to do. Well, what has Baron Gruner been up to? I presume it is not this old tragedy which has come up again. No, it is more serious than that. To revenge crime is important, but to prevent it is more so. It is a terrible thing, Mr. Holmes, to see a dreadful event, an atrocious situation, preparing itself before your eyes, to clearly understand whither it will lead, and yet to be utterly unable to avert it. Can a human being be placed in a more trying position? Perhaps not. Then you will sympathize with the client in whose interests I am acting. I did not understand that you were merely an intermediary. Who is the principal? Mr. Holmes, I must beg you not to press that question. It is important that I should be able to assure him that his honoured name has been in no way dragged into the matter. His motives are, to the last degree, honourable and chivalrous, but he prefers to remain unknown. I need not say that your fees will be assured, and you will be given a perfectly free hand. Surely the actual name of your client is immaterial. I am sorry, said Holmes. I am accustomed to have mystery at one end of my cases, but to have it at both ends is too confusing. I fear, Sir James, that I must decline to act. Our visitor was greatly disturbed. His large, sensitive face was darkened with emotion and disappointment. "'You hardly realize the effect of your own action, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'You place me in a most serious dilemma, for I am perfectly certain that you would be proud to take over the case if I could give you the facts, and yet a promise forbids me from revealing them all. May I at least lay all that I can before you?' "'By all means, so long as it is understood that I commit myself to nothing.' That is understood. In the first place, you have no doubt heard of General de Merville. De Merville of Khyber fame, yes, I have heard of him. He has a daughter, Violet de Merville, young, rich, beautiful, accomplished, a wonder woman in every way. It is this daughter, this lovely, innocent girl, whom we are endeavouring to save from the clutches of a fiend. Baron Gruna has some hold over her, then? The strongest of all holds where a woman is concerned, the hold of love. The fellow is, as you may have heard, extraordinarily handsome, with a most fascinating manner, a gentle voice, and that air of romance and mystery which means so much to a woman. He is said to have the whole sex at his mercy, and to have made ample use of the fact. But how came such a man to meet a lady of the standing of Miss Violet de Merville? It was on a Mediterranean yachting voyage. The company, though select, paid their own passages. No doubt the promoters hardly realized the Baron's true character until it was too late. The villain attached himself to the lady, and with such effect that he has completely and absolutely won her heart. To say that she loves him hardly expresses it. She dotes upon him. She is obsessed by him. Outside of him there is nothing on earth. She will not hear one word against him. Everything has been done to cure her of her madness, but in vain. To sum up, she proposes to marry him next month. As she is of age and has a will of iron, it is hard to know how to prevent her. Does she know about the Austrian episode? The cunning devil has told her every unsavoury public scandal of his past life, but always in such a way as to make himself out to be an innocent martyr. She absolutely accepts his version and will listen to no other. Dear me, but surely you have inadvertently let out the name of your client. It is no doubt General de Merville. Our visitor fidgeted in his chair. I could deceive you by saying so, Mr. Holmes, but it would not be true. De Merville is a broken man. The strong soldier has been utterly demoralized by this incident. He has lost the nerve which never failed him on the battlefield, and has become a weak, doddering old man, utterly incapable of contending with a brilliant, forceful rascal like this Austrian. My client, however, is an old friend, 
one who has known the general intimately for many years and taken a paternal interest in this young girl since she wore short frocks, he cannot see this tragedy consummated without some attempt to stop it. There is nothing in which Scotland Yard can act. It was his own suggestion that you should be called in, but it was, as I have said, on the express stipulation that he should not be personally involved in the matter. I have no doubt, Mr. Holmes, that with your great powers you could easily trace my client back through me. But I must ask you as a point of honour to refrain from doing so and not to break in upon his incognito. Holmes gave a whimsical smile. I think I may safely promise that, said he. I may add that your problem interests me and that I shall be prepared to look into it. How shall I keep in touch with you? The Carlton Club will find me. But in case of emergency, there is a private telephone call, XX31. Holmes noted it down and sat, still smiling, with the open memorandum book upon his knee. The Baron's present address, please. Vernon Lodge, near Kingston. It is a large house. He has been fortunate in some rather shady speculations and is a rich man, which naturally makes him a more dangerous antagonist. Is he at home at present? Yes. Apart from what you have told me, can you give me any further information about the man? He has expensive tastes. He is a horse fancier. For a short time he played polo at Hurlingham, but then this Prague affair got noised about and he had to leave. He collects books and pictures. He is a man with a considerable artistic side to his nature— he is, I believe, a recognised authority upon Chinese pottery and has written a book upon the subject. A ah, complex mind, said Holmes. All great criminals have that. My old friend Charlie Peace was a violin virtuoso. Wainwright was no mean artist. I could quote many more. Well, Sir James, you will inform your client that I am turning my mind upon Baron Gruner. I can say no more. I have some sources of information of my own, and I dare say we may find some means of opening the matter up. When our visitor had left us, Holmes sat so long in deep thought that it seemed to me that he had forgotten my presence. At last, however, he came briskly back to earth. "'Well, Watson, any views?' he asked. "'I should think you'd better see the young lady herself. "'My dear Watson,' If her poor old broken father cannot move her, how shall I, a stranger, prevail? And yet there is something in the suggestion, if all else fails. But I think we must begin from a different angle. I rather fancy that Shinwell Johnson might be a help. I have not had occasion to mention Shinwell Johnson in these memoirs, because I have seldom drawn my cases from the latter phases of my friend's career. During the first years of the century he became a valuable assistant. Johnson, I grieve to say, made his name first as a very dangerous villain, and served two terms at Parkhurst. Finally he repented, and allied himself to Holmes, acting as his agent in the huge criminal underworld of London, and obtaining information which often proved to be of vital importance. Had Johnson been a narc of the police, he would soon have been exposed, but as he dealt with cases which never came directly into the courts, his activities were never realized by his companions. With the glamour of his two convictions upon him, he had the entree of every nightclub, doss house, and gambling den in the town, and his quick observation and active brain made him an ideal agent for gaining information. It was to him that Sherlock Holmes now proposed to turn. It was not possible for me to follow the immediate steps taken by my friend, for I had some pressing professional business of my own, but I met him by appointment that evening at Simpson's, where, sitting at a small table in the front window and looking down at the rushing stream of life in the Strand, he told me something of what had passed. "'Johnson is on the prowl,' said he. "'He may pick up some garbage in the darker recesses of the underworld,' for it is down there amid the black roots of crime that we must hunt for this man's secrets. But if the lady will not accept what is already known, why should any fresh discovery of yours turn her from her purpose? Who knows, Watson? 
Woman's heart and mind are insoluble puzzles to the male. Murder might be condoned or explained, and yet some smaller offence might rankle. Baron Gruner remarked to me, he remarked to you. Oh, to be sure, I had not told you my plans. Well, Watson, I love to come to close grips with my man. I like to meet him eye to eye and read for myself the stuff that he is made of. When I had given Johnson his instructions— I took a cab out to Kingston and found the Baron in a most affable mood. Did he recognize you? There was no difficulty about that, for I simply sent in my card. He is an excellent antagonist, cool as ice, silky-voiced and soothing as one of your fashionable consultants, and poisonous as a cobra. He has breeding in him, a real aristocrat of crime, with a superficial suggestion of afternoon tea— and all the cruelty of the grave behind it. Yes, I am glad to have had my attention called to Baron Adelbert Gruner. You say he was affable? A purring cat who thinks he sees prospective mice. Some people's affability is more deadly than the violence of coarser souls. His greeting was characteristic. I rather thought I should see you sooner or later, Mr. Holmes, said he. You have been engaged, no doubt, by General de Merville, to endeavour to stop my marriage with his daughter Violet. That is so, is it not? I acquiesced. My dear man, said he, you will only ruin your own well-deserved reputation. It is not a case in which you can possibly succeed. You will have barren work to say nothing of incurring some danger. Let me very strongly advise you to draw off at once. It is curious, I answered. "'but that was the very advice which I had intended to give you. "'I have a respect for your brains, Baron, "'and the little which I have seen of your personality has not lessened it. "'Let me put it to you as man to man. "'No one wants to rake up your past and make you unduly uncomfortable. "'It is over, and you are now in smooth waters, "'but if you persist in this marriage, "'you will raise up a swarm of powerful enemies.' "'who will never leave you alone "'till they have made England too hot to hold you. "'Is the game worth it? "'Surely you would be wiser "'if you left the lady alone. "'It would not be pleasant for you "'if these facts of your past "'are brought to her notice. "'The Baron has little waxed tips of hair "'under his nose, "'like the short antennae of an insect. "'These quivered with amusement as he listened, "'and he finally broke into a gentle chuckle. (laughs) "'Excuse my amusement, Mr. Holmes,' said he, "'but it is really funny to see you trying to play a hand with no cards in it. "'I don't think anyone could do it better, "'but it is rather pathetic all the same. "'Not a colour card there, Mr. Holmes, "'nothing but the smallest of the small. "'So you think. "'So I know. "'Let me make the thing clear to you, "'for my own hand is so strong that I can afford to show it.' I have been fortunate enough to win the entire affection of this lady. This was given to me in spite of the fact that I told her very clearly of all the unhappy incidents in my past life. I also told her that certain wicked and designing persons, I hope you recognize yourself, would come to her and tell her these things, and I warned her how to treat them. You have heard of post-hypnotic suggestion, Mr. Holmes? Well, you will see how it works, for a man of personality can use hypnotism without any vulgar passes or tomfoolery. So she is ready for you, and I have no doubt would give you an appointment, for she is quite amenable to her father's will, save only in the one little matter. Disc 3 I think... I could show you the very paving stone upon which I stood when my eyes fell upon the placard, and a pang of horror passed through my very soul. It was between the Grand Hotel and Charing Cross Station, where a one-legged news vendor displayed his evening papers. The date was just two days after the last conversation. There, black upon yellow, was the terrible news sheet. Murderous attack! upon Sherlock Holmes. I think I stood stunned for some moments. Then I have a confused recollection of snatching at a paper, of the remonstrance of the man whom I had not paid, and finally 
of standing in the doorway of a chemist's shop while I turned up the fateful paragraph. This was how it ran. We learn, with regret, that Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the well-known private detective, was the victim this morning of a murderous assault which has left him in a precarious position. There are no exact details to hand, but the event seems to have occurred about twelve o'clock in Regent Street outside the Café Royal. The attack was made by two men armed with sticks, and Mr. Holmes was beaten about the head and body, receiving injuries which the doctors describe as most serious. He was carried to Charing Cross Hospital, and afterwards insisted upon being taken to his rooms in Baker Street. The miscreants who attacked him appear to have been respectably dressed men, who escaped from the bystanders by passing through the Café Royal and out into Glasshouse Street behind it. No doubt they belonged to that criminal fraternity which has so often had occasion to bewail the activity and ingenuity of the injured man. I need not say that my eyes had hardly glanced over the paragraph before I had sprung into a hansom and was on my way to Baker Street. I found Sir Leslie Oakshot, the famous surgeon in the hall, and his brougham waiting at the curb. No immediate danger, was his report. Two lacerated scalp wounds and some considerable bruises. Several stitches have been necessary. Morphine has been injected and quiet is essential, but an interview of a few minutes would not be absolutely forbidden. With this permission, I stole into the darkened room. The sufferer was wide awake, and I heard my name in a hoarse whisper. The blind was three-quarters down, but one ray of sunlight slanted through and struck the bandaged head of the injured man. A crimson patch had soaked through the white linen compress. I sat beside him and bent my head. "'All right, Watson, don't look so scared.' he muttered in a very weak voice. It's not as bad as it seems. Thank God for that. I am a bit of a single-stick expert, as you know. I took most of them on my guard. It was the second man that was too much for me. What can I do, Holmes? Of course it was that damned fellow who set them on. I'll go and thrash the hide off him if you give the word. Good old Watson. <laughs> no, we can do nothing there unless the police lay their hands on the men. But their getaway had been well prepared. We may be sure of that. Wait a little. I have my plans. The first thing is to exaggerate my injuries. They'll come to you for news. Put it on thick, Watson. Lucky if I live the week out. Concussion, delirium, what you like. You can't overdo it. But Sir Leslie Oakshot. Oh, he's all right. He shall see the worst side of me. I look after that. Anything else? Yes. Tell Shinwell Johnson to get that girl out of the way. Those beauties will be after her now. They know, of course, that she was with me in the case. If they dared to do me in, it's not likely they will neglect her. That is urgent. Do it tonight. I'll go now. A anything more? I'll put my pipe on the table and the tobacco slipper. Right. Come in each morning and we will plan our campaign. I arranged with Johnson that evening to take Miss Winter to a quiet suburb and see that she lay low until the danger was past. For six days, the public were under the impression that Holmes was at the door of death. The bulletins were very grave, and there were sinister paragraphs in the papers. My continual visits assured me that it was not so bad as that. His wiry constitution and his determined will were working wonders. He was recovering fast, and I had suspicions at times that he was really finding himself faster than he pretended even to me. There was a curious secretive streak in the man which led to many dramatic effects, but left even his closest friend guessing as to what his exact plans might be. He pushed to an extreme the axiom that the only safe plotter was he who plotted alone. I was nearer him than anyone else, and yet I was always conscious of the gap between. On the seventh day the stitches were taken out, in spite of which there was a report of erysipelas in the evening papers. The same evening papers had an announcement which I was bound, sick or well, to carry to my friend. It was simply that among the passengers on the Cunard boat Ruritania, starting from Liverpool on Friday, was the Baron Adelbert Gruner, 
who had some important financial business to settle in the States before his impending wedding to Miss Violet de Merville, only daughter of etc., etc. Holmes listened to the news with a cold, concentrated look upon his pale face, which told me that it hit him hard. "'Friday!' he cried. "'Only three clear days! I believe the rascal wants to put himself out of danger's way, but he won't, Watson! By the Lord Harry, he won't! Now, Watson, I want you to do something for me.' "'I'm here to be used, Holmes. Well, then, spend the next twenty-four hours—' in an intensive study of Chinese pottery. He gave no explanations, and I asked for none. By long experience I had learned the wisdom of obedience. But when I had left his room I walked down Baker Street, revolving in my head how on earth I was to carry out so strange an order. Finally I drove to the London Library in St. James's Square, put the matter to my friend Lomax, the sub-librarian, and departed to my rooms with a goodly volume under my arm. It is said that the barrister who crams up a case with such care that he can examine an expert witness upon the Monday has forgotten all his forced knowledge before the Saturday. Certainly I should not like now to pose as an authority upon ceramics. And yet, all that evening, and all that night with a short interval for rest, and all next morning, I was sucking in knowledge and committing names to memory. There— I learned of the hallmarks of the great artist decorators, of the mystery of cyclical dates, the marks of the Hung Wu, and the beauties of the Yung Lo, the writings of Tang Ying, and the glories of the primitive period of the Song and the Yuan. I was charged with all this information when I called upon Holmes next evening. He was out of bed now, though you would not have guessed it from the published reports, and he sat with his much bandaged head resting upon his hand in the depth of his favourite armchair. "'Why, Holmes,' I said, "'if one believed the papers, you are dying.' "'That,' said he, "'is the very impression which I intended to convey. "'And now, Watson, have you learned your lessons? "'Or at least I've tried to. "'Good. "'You could keep up an intelligent conversation on the subject?' "'I believe I could. "'Then hand me that little box from the mantelpiece.' He opened the lid, and took out a small object most carefully wrapped in some fine eastern silk. This he unfolded, and disclosed a delicate little saucer of the most beautiful deep blue colour. It needs careful handling, Watson. This is the real eggshell pottery of the Ming dynasty. No finer piece ever passed through Christie's. A complete set of this would be worth— a king's ransom, in fact, it is doubtful if there is a complete set outside the imperial palace of Peking. The sight of this would drive a real connoisseur wild. What am I to do with it? Holmes handed me a card upon which was printed, Dr. Hill Barton, 369 Half Moon Street. That is your name for the evening, Watson. You will call upon Baron Gruner. I know something of his habits, and at half-past eight he would probably be disengaged. A note will tell him in advance that you are about to call, and you will say that you are bringing him a specimen of an absolutely unique set of Ming china. You may as well be a medical man, since that is a part which you can play without duplicity. You are a collector. This set has come your way. You have heard of the Baron's interest in the subject, and you are not averse to selling at a price. What price? "'Well asked, Watson. "'You would certainly fall down badly "'if you did not know the value of your own wares. "'This saucer was got for me by Sir James, "'and comes, I understand, from the collection of his client. "'You will not exaggerate if you say "'that it could hardly be matched in the world. Well, "'I could perhaps suggest that the set should be valued um, by an expert. "'Excellent, Watson. You scintillate today. Suggest. Christie or Sotheby, your delicacy prevents your putting a price for yourself. Uh, b b b but if he won't see me— Oh, yes, he will see you. He has the collection mania in its most acute form, and especially on this subject on which he is an acknowledged authority. Sit down, Watson, and I will dictate the letter. No answer needed. 
You will merely say that you are coming, and why. It was an admirable document, short, courteous, and stimulating to the curiosity of the connoisseur. A district messenger was duly dispatched with it. On the same evening, with a precious saucer in my hand, and the card of Dr. Hill Barton in my pocket, I set off on my own adventure. The beautiful house and grounds indicated that Baron Gruner was, as Sir James had said, a man of considerable wealth. A long, winding drive, with banks of rare shrubs on either side, opened out into a great gravelled square adorned with statues. The place had been built by a South African gold king in the days of the great boom, and the long, low house with the turrets at the corners, though an architectural nightmare, was imposing in its size and solidity. A butler, who would have adorned a bench of bishops, showed me in, and handed me over to a plush-clad footman who ushered me into the baron's presence. He was standing at the open front of a great case which stood between the windows and which contained part of his Chinese collection. He turned as I entered with a small brown vase in his hand. "'Pray sit down, doctor,' said he. "'I was looking over my own treasures and wondering whether I could really afford to add to them. This little tang specimen, which dates from the seventh century, would probably interest you. I'm sure you never saw finer workmanship or a richer glaze. Have you the Ming saucer with you of which you spoke? I carefully unpacked it and handed it to him. He seated himself at his desk, pulled over the lamp, for it was growing dark, and set himself to examine it. As he did so, the yellow light beat upon his own features, and I was able to study them at my ease. He was certainly a remarkably handsome man. His European reputation for beauty was fully deserved. In figure he was not more than of middle size, but was built upon graceful and active lines. His face was swarthy, almost oriental, with large, dark, languorous eyes, which might easily hold an irresistible fascination for women. His hair and moustache were raven black, the latter short, pointed, and carefully waxed. His features were regular and pleasing, save only his straight, thin-lipped mouth. If ever I saw a murderer's mouth, it was there. A cruel, hard gash in the face, compressed, inexorable, and terrible. He was ill-advised to train his moustache away from it, for it was nature's danger signal set as a warning to his victims. His voice was engaging, and his manners perfect. I should have put him a little over thirty, though his record afterwards showed that he was forty-two. Very fine, very fine indeed, he said at last. And you say you have a set of six to correspond? What puzzles me is that I should not have heard of such magnificent specimens. I only know of one in England to match this and it is certainly not likely to be in the market. Would it be indiscreet if I were to ask you, Dr. Hill Barton, how you obtained this? Oh, does it really matter? I asked, with as careless an air as I could muster. You can see that the piece is genuine, and as to the value, I'm content to take an expert's valuation. Very mysterious, said he with a quick suspicious flash of his dark eyes. In dealing with objects of such value, one naturally wishes to know all about the transaction. That the piece is genuine is certain. I have no doubts at all about that. But suppose I am bound to take every possibility into account that it should prove afterwards that you had no right to sell. Oh, I would guarantee you against any claim of the sort. That, of course, would open up the question as to what your guarantee was worth. My bankers would answer that. Quite so. And yet, the whole transaction strikes me as rather unusual. Oh, you can do business or not, said I with indifference. 
I have given you the first offer, as I understand that you were a connoisseur, but I shall have no difficulty in other quarters. Who told you I was a connoisseur? I was aware that you had written a book upon the subject. If you read the book? No. Dear me, this becomes more and more difficult for me to understand. You are a connoisseur and collector with a very valuable piece in your collection, and yet you have never troubled to consult the one book which would have told you of the real meaning and value of what you held. How do you explain that? I am a very busy man. I am a doctor in practice. That is no answer. If a man has a hobby, he follows it up, whatever his other pursuits may be. You said in your note that you were a connoisseur. So I am. Might I ask you a few questions to test you? I am obliged to tell you, doctor, if you are indeed a doctor, that the incident becomes more and more suspicious. I would ask you, what do you know of the Emperor Shomu, and how do you associate him with the Shoso Inn near Nara? Dear me, does that puzzle you? Tell me a little about the Northern Wei dynasty and its place in the history of ceramics. I sprang from my chair in simulated anger. This is intolerable, sir, said I. I came here to do you a favor, not to be examined as if I was a schoolboy. My knowledge on these subjects may be second only to your own, but I certainly shall not answer questions which have been put in so offensive a way. He looked at me steadily. The languor had gone from his eyes. He suddenly glared. There was a gleam of teeth from between those cruel lips. What is the game? You are here as a spy. You are an emissary of Holmes. This is a trick that you are playing upon me. The fellow is dying, I hear, so he sends his tools to keep watch upon me. You have made your way in here without leave, and by God you may find it harder to get out than to get in. He had sprung to his feet, and I stepped back, bracing myself for an attack, for the man was beside himself with rage. He may have suspected me from the first. Certainly, this cross-examination had shown him the truth, but it was clear that I could not hope to deceive him. He dived his hand into a side drawer and rummaged furiously, and something struck upon his ear, for he stood listening intently. Ah! he cried. Ah! and dashed into the room behind him. Two steps took me to the open door, and my mind will ever carry a clear picture of the scene within. The window leading out to the garden was wide open. Beside it, looking like some terrible ghost, his head girt with bloody bandages, his face drawn and white, stood Sherlock Holmes. The next instant he was through the gap, and I heard the crash of his body among the laurel bushes outside. With a howl of rage, the master of the house rushed after him to the open window, and then it was done in an instant, and yet I clearly saw it. An arm, a woman's arm, shot out from among the leaves. At the same instant, the baron uttered a horrible cry, a yell, which will always ring in my memory. He clapped his two hands to his face and rushed round the room, beating his head horribly against the walls. Then he fell upon the carpet, rolling and writhing, while scream after scream resounded through the house. Water! For God's sake! Water! was his cry. I seized a carafe from a side table and rushed to his aid. At the same moment, the butler and several footmen ran in from the hall. I remember that one of them fainted as I knelt by the injured man and turned that awful face to the light of the lamp. The vitriol was eating into it everywhere and dripping from the ears and the chin. One eye was already white and glazed. The other was red and inflamed. The features which I had admired a few minutes before are now like some beautiful painting over which the artist has passed a wet and foul sponge. They were blurred, discoloured, inhuman, terrible. 
In a few words, I explained exactly what had occurred, so far as the vitriol attack was concerned. Some had climbed through the window, and others had rushed out onto the lawn, but it was dark, and it had begun to rain. Between his screams, the victim raged and raved against the Avenger. It was that hell cat, Kitty Winter, he cried. Oh, the sea devil! She, ah, she shall pay for it! She shall pay! Oh, God in heaven! This pain is more than I can bear! I bathed his face in oil, put cotton wadding on the raw surfaces, and administered a hypodermic of morphia. All suspicion of me had passed from his mind in the presence of this shock, and he clung to my hands as if I might have the power even yet to clear those dead fish eyes which gazed up at me. I could have wept over the ruin, had I not remembered very clearly the vile life which had led up to so hideous a change. It was loathsome to feel the pawing of his burning hands, and I was relieved when his family surgeon, closely followed by a specialist, came to relieve me of my charge. An inspector of police had also arrived, and to him I handed my real card. It would have been useless, as well as foolish, to do otherwise, for I was nearly as well known by sight at the yard as Holmes himself. Then I left that house of gloom and terror. Within an hour I was at Baker Street. Holmes was seated in his familiar chair, looking very pale and exhausted. Apart from his injuries, even his iron nerves had been shocked by the events of the evening, and he listened with horror to my account of the Baron's transformation. The wages of sin, Watson, the wages of sin, said he. Sooner or later it will always come. God knows there was sin enough, he added, taking up a brown volume from the table. Here is the book the woman talked of. If this will not break off the marriage, nothing ever could. But it will, Watson. It must. No self-respecting woman could stand it. It is his love diary, or his lust diary, call it what you will. The moment the woman told us of it, I realized what a tremendous weapon was there if we could but lay our hands on it. I said nothing at the time to indicate my thoughts, for this woman might have given it away, but I brooded over it. Then this assault upon me gave me the chance of letting the Baron think that no precautions need be taken against me. That was all to the good. I would have waited a little longer but his visit to America forced my hand. He would never have left so compromising a document behind him. Therefore, we had to act at once. Burglary at night is impossible. He takes precautions. But there was a chance in the evening if I could only be sure that his attention was engaged. That was where you and your blue saucer came in. But I had to be sure of the position of the book and I knew I had only a few minutes in which to act, for my time was limited by your knowledge of Chinese pottery. Therefore, I gathered the girl up at the last moment. How could I guess what the little packet was that she carried so carefully under her cloak? I thought she had come altogether on my business, but it seems she had some of her own. He guessed I came from you. I feared he would. But you held him in play just long enough for me to get the book, though not long enough for an unobserved escape. Ah, Sir James, I'm very glad you have come. Our courtly friend had appeared in answer to a previous summons. He listened with the deepest attention to Holmes's account of what had occurred. You have done wonders, wonders, he cried when he had heard the narrative. But if these injuries are as terrible as Dr. Watson describes, then surely our purpose of thwarting the marriage is sufficiently gained without the use of this horrible book. Holmes shook his head. Women of the de Merville type do not act like that. She would love him the more, as a disfigured martyr. No, 
No, it is his moral side, not his physical, which we have to destroy. That book will bring her back to earth, and I know nothing else that could. It is in his own writing. She cannot get past it. Sir James carried away both it and the precious saucer. As I was myself overdue, I went down with him into the street. A brougham was waiting for him. He sprang in, gave a hurried order to the cockaded coachman, and drove swiftly away. He flung his overcoat half out of the window to cover the armorial bearings upon the panel, but I had seen them in the glare of our fanlight nonetheless. I gasped with surprise. Then I turned back and ascended the stair to Holmes's room. I found out who our client is, I cried, bursting with my great news. Why, Holmes, it is, it is a loyal friend and a chivalrous gentleman, said Holmes, holding up a restraining hand. Let that now and forever be enough for us. I do not know how the incriminating book was used. Sir James may have managed it, or it is more probable that so delicate a task was entrusted to the young lady's father. The effect, at any rate, was all that could be desired. Three days later appeared a paragraph in the Morning Post to say that the marriage between Baron Adalbert Gruner and Miss Violet de Merville would not take place. The same paper had the first police court hearing of the proceedings against Miss Kitty Winter on the grave charge of vitriol throwing. Such extenuating circumstances came out in the trial that the sentence, as will be remembered, was the lowest that was possible for such an offence. Sherlock Holmes was threatened with a prosecution for burglary, but when an object is good and a client is sufficiently illustrious, even the rigid British law becomes human and elastic. My friend has not yet stood in the dock.